It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so that you make better financial decisions in your life. Today, I have a couple of things I want to talk about. First, the cryptocurrency market. And I don't think I've gotten more Clark Stinks about any other topic since Clark Stinks started 20-something years ago than crypto, but we're going to talk about it. Also want to give you an update on my prostate cancer 14 years in, and I want to tell you it is good news I'll share with you, and of course we have your questions. So suddenly it's all in. I'm seeing not just in the financial media, but also in the general media to say, I told you so, that crypto thing, told you. And I just hate that. And I said that I've gotten more Clark stinks about crypto than any other topic ever. Because my position on crypto is unchanged at this moment. Same thing even with all the declines, the cryptos that have failed in the last couple of weeks. The reality is, having some form of digital currency is definitely part of the future. What I've said about today's cryptos is they are not ready for prime time. And here's why. First of all, we've had all the fraud with the fake cryptos, the organizations promoting one and stealing all your money multiple ways, like people that are into crypto talk about rug pulls where there's a promoter falsely promoting that they're going to do this new crypto and you pay this money in and then they vanish in the night with all your money and uh, there's there's such a wild west nature right now with crypto plus crypto is not a mature way to do things yet because if it was you would know in the morning that the value was the same as it was yesterday morning and tomorrow morning, or within a fraction of its current value. Today, you don't know from morning to night what the value of a crypto is going to be up or down. It's become a wildly speculative fever. And as I'm talking to you right now, best guess estimates, somewhere between 60% And two-thirds of people who have put money into crypto, you did not hear me say the word invest, people who put money into crypto have lost money on it. Unless you've been in crypto a really long time, um, you are upside down. You're underwater with it. And then in the worst cases, you've either been defrauded by cryptos that went to zero or never really happened or you got into cryptos that have lost most of their value. Um, the one that's been the most dramatic is the uh, the stable coin thing where the idea of what I talked about is that the value is recognizable and consistent and supposed to be pegged uh, to the US dollar without having a change in value different than the value of the dollar. Well, one of the big ones of those has crashed and burned. And so this is an area that let me give it let me give an example that is something that unless you've been around oh let's say you're 45 years or older you don't even know what I'm talking about unless you studied it in school. So back in the 1990s more than a generation ago there was a mania about online commerce okay imagine because it was a new concept most people were still on what was called dial-up internet and it was just in its infancy the idea of being able to buy things online and have them magically just show up at your home or business it was a brand new idea and so there were all these heavily funded speculative dot-coms And so this went on through the 90s with these companies that there was a funny thing. The more money they lost, the higher their stock price went. 
And today, when people study investing in college, you know, when they're, if they're a finance person in college, they study what happened with the 90s mania. And they talk about specific companies. There was one called Pets.com that lost untold billions. And then the biggest loser of all was one called Webvan. And it was uh, the first version of a fully automated warehouse with grocery delivery. And it lost, I don't even know how many billions of dollars before it failed. These were not frauds. These were, although there were some fraudulent dot-coms, they were just taking money from people and didn't actually launch any business. But these were people that were the pioneers who went out and tried to start dot-coms. One of them that almost failed um, in the era that all the dot-coms became dot-bombs, which was right around year 2000, was Amazon.com. Amazon survived by the skin of its teeth and went on to become the huge and influential retailer it is, not just in the United States, but in a lot of other countries. So it's not, it's not a great parallel, but I wanted to give you the idea. So it was clear in the 90s that online shopping was going to become a thing as the internet matured. But online shopping was first fed by this speculative wave of investing in the 90s, and people lost their shirts. In fact, it took, was it 15 years for the the tech sector to recover the values overall that it had had in 1999, uh, leading to the crash of 2000, to come back to life. But today, so much a part of our life is going on our smartphones, which did not exist, by the way, during the first uh, dot-com era of the 90s. No smartphones, almost no high-speed internet connections at homes or businesses, or obviously not on a phone. But today, part of our lives, these companies have real value, make profits, a lot of them, and they serve a real uh, need or want in the marketplace. So the analogy I'm trying to make is that crypto at this point is just that. It is a speculative fever. And most of the cryptos that exist today are ultimately going to go to zero. What will emerge? We don't even know the shape, form, or how it will actually work in our lives, in a digital wallet, in our uh, spending decisions, in our savings decisions, in all those things. And so know that that's why you've heard me say for the last, I guess, 10 years, that this is something you don't ever put money into that you must have to live on. Um, I'm so distressed, so worried about people that are doing these online postings saying that they've lost everything in crypto and they're going to take their lives. Let me tell you something. You have plenty of life in front of you to rebuild whatever you have lost. And the value of what you've learned about how you handle your money in the future is something that a lot of times we learn things through school of hard knocks. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Do not allow yourself to be overcome with being despondent because the crypto or cryptos you got into did not work out. But ultimately, digital money will become part of our lives. But we're just in this very, very early phase, the pioneering days, where you have the crooks, you have the con artists, you have the speculators, and you have the believers. I saw a cute thing today. I think it was Kristen, the Wall Street Journal. I may be wrong about the source. It was how all the celebrity endorsers have gone absolutely silent. All the people who've been doing the commercials on sports, I only see them on football. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I assume they're doing them on other things as well. They're... That was on the New York Times, by the way. Oh, it was New York Times. Thank you. So how did you find that so quickly? It's my job. You're just, you're just amazing. Job. So um, all those people who made all that money hyping all these 
cryptos. Now they're like, who, me? What? Huh? I don't know what you're talking about. So um, just because somebody you really like as an influencer or somebody you like because of what they do on television or movies or on a, a football field or there are other sports. <laughs> anyway, um, anybody who you look up to because of what they do as a star, be wary about following their drummer, marching to their drummer, because remember, their drum was paid for. What they're saying was paid for. A lot of podcasters, too. Tell me about that. Podcasters that are doing uh, advertorial? Yeah, or, yeah, endorsements for these things, for oh, sure. Oh, oh, yeah. I know what you, oh, okay, I see what you mean. And people you listening didn't mean to this. People doing a podcast pretending they were giving content of whatever. And oh, just, I'm sure no. that happens too. But okay. I'm just saying like people you look up to, like you were saying, most people who listen to podcasts listen to other podcasts and it happens. So the point I hope is understood and well taken. And again, the website to go to is clark.com slash Clark Stinks to let me know where I'm missing the boat yet again on crypto. Krista? Let's start with Cardi in Mississippi's question. Clark, I love your show. I keep a decent amount of money, about three to six months of expenses for emergencies in a savings account. I recently came across these prepaid debit cards that give savings as high as 5% up into a certain dollar value. I do not want to use their debit card for transactions. I just want to use their savings account to get the interest. What do you think? I think it's just fine as long as the savings account is FDIC insured or NCUA insured. If it's just, hey, we promise we're going to pay you much higher than market interest rate, but they're silent about federal insurance, which covers you up to a quarter million dollars, stay away. But as long as the um, stored value card, the debit card, gives you the ability to put the money in an FDIC insured account, great go for it and along similar line this is from johnny in maine i've decided to churn bank accounts as a side hustle both checking accounts and credit cards for close to 10 years i'll open a checking account set up direct deposit get a bonus and close the account after i've met the requirements in the terms and conditions after i obtained a 2.65 percent apr mortgage two years ago i've opened numerous credit cards each card gives me cash after spending a certain amount. 0% interest for at least 12 months is also something I appreciate. Is there anything wrong with what I'm doing? If I keep a FICO score above 800, will this affect an auto loan in the future? Will they look at my available credit and compare it to my salary? What kind of ratio is best? Okay, so Johnny, your strategy is one that will always work because the banks know you're like a fraction of 1%. People who sign up fully intending to, well, I'm only going to keep that account open six weeks or whatever. I'm only going to get this bonus. Um, they don't worry about the fact that there's, it's like the people who go into a supermarket and only buy the sale items and then leave. There's almost nobody who does that. The reason they offer those advertised specials is they know most people will come in and they'll get that special and then they see something else, and they're like, oh, I want that, and I want that, and I want that. Guilty. And that's you. <laughs> yes. And so then they end up making the, the money they want to make. So Chase, though, is on to you, and now American Express as well. If you apply with either of them, and who knows who else is going to do this as well, for credit cards that have big upfront bonuses, after you've done a certain number that – usually with Chase is uh, five cards in a period of time, you're shut down. They, they may give you the card, but they, you're invalidated for the bonuses. American Express, same idea. And that's because although people don't tend to do what you do with checking accounts and savings accounts, people do play that game with credit cards. And so they are uh, clamping down on that. As far as your score, you have a great score. Don't worry about it. The uh, amount of debt you're carrying, available credit, only could potentially come up as a roadblock in applying for a mortgage. A lot of mortgage underwriters freak out about how much available credit somebody may have sitting unused on credit cards. And if they're worried about that, they'll tell you. Auto loan, no worry at all. 
And this is from Anthony in New Jersey. I know you're a big fan of using Consumer Reports when planning a big purchase, and I agree, but I'm not a subscriber. What is the best way to access a Consumer Reports database if one is only looking for a specific big ticket item? Note, I'm looking for the best riding lawnmower I can buy, as I have about a half acre that I'm currently mowing with a traditional push mower, but riding mowers are a big purchase, and I want to be sure I'm buying the right one. So Consumer Reports is available from your local library, and almost always in addition to the physical copy you can check out or do lend on it, mm -hmm. online access is available through many libraries. So if you're not a member of your local library, you can do that. Otherwise, you can buy one-time access to their coverage of lawnmowers. I want to say something about lawnmowers. You're going to own this riding lawnmower an ultra-long time. And I know this is going to sound weird. Look at electric versions. Electric versions have a lot uh, fewer maintenance problems and are much, much, much cheaper to run than a traditional gas engine mower, and you don't mess up your hearing. And Consumer Reports is $10 a month, if you, and it, you can cancel at any time. So if you have a bunch of stuff you're trying to do, maybe pay the 10 bucks, and then you know if you don't have access to it at your library or whatever. Yeah, because Consumer Reports lives off of subscriber yes. revenue, both their online and the physical edition of Consumer Reports because they don't accept any advertising at all. It could save you a lot more than $10, right? Well, particularly with a purchase like a lawnmower. Yeah. Um, have you ever cut your own lawn? No. You've never cut a lawn I've in your never, life? Never, no. But in high school, I used to do that to make money. I would cut lawns and I would, uh, the worst though was when the leaves would fall in the fall and you'd have to rake leaves for I it seemed like plenty of that Manual I had raking. I had a customer who had a yard that big yard trees everywhere and it just used to kill me having to rake all those leaves but I sure did like the money I'd rake them into a big pile and then you jump into them that's fun too really mm -hmm. okay um, coming up ahead I want to talk about What's going on with my prostate cancer? People ask me regularly all through the years, and I want to tell you the update on how my health is doing and whether the prostate cancer is anything I need to freak out about. Roughly 14 years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which is one of the most confusing of all cancers because you hear that diagnosis and it could mean anything from, uh, gosh, an instant fight for your life to a slow, steady growth that unrecognized, untreated could ultimately take your life to people who can be diagnosed with prostate cancer but will never do anything to them and they'll never die from it. And Krista, I remember when I was diagnosed 14 years ago you were you were like so freaked out as was my wife Lane. I mean, you were. We were on I a rem staff trip when you got yeah, the diagnosis we were, in China. We were in Shanghai, China, and I remember we came back to work, and I came in the first day, and you had um, uh, some candles lit. I always that, have candles in my office. Yeah, no, but you had candles lit specifically because you were praying for my survival. <laughs> I mean, you were really worried you were going to lose me. Well, you know, you don't like to hear cancer. It's a scary right. word, right? Right. And the reality is with more and more cancers, it is a disease management now instead of, you know, a death certificate. And I remember when I was growing up that people, when someone was diagnosed with cancer, they couldn't even say the word. They would they would say uh, someone has a malignancy, like that was better or something. Or quietly, cancer. No, they, they would not say the <laughs> My C word. My family. Oh, your family, mm -hmm. they would whisper it. I mean, it was just this thing because in that era, cancer equaled death. When you were young and until I was, well, I'm a lot older than you, but um, 
through my youth and then into my young adulthood, people couldn't cough the word out because of what it meant. Today, there are still cancers that a diagnosis may be deadly, but more and more, it means that it is something to be managed. And in the case of two of the most common cancers, prostate cancer, most common cancer with men, breast cancer, the most common women's cancer, both have similarities, interestingly enough, with genetics, that there are different, uh, for lack of a better term, genetic versions of the cancer. And uh, many breast cancers are actually not life-threatening, at least early on. Some are never life-threatening. Prostate cancer, the same thing, with roughly two dozen different genetic types of prostate cancer. Today, we don't know exactly what genetic makeup prostate cancer has in a guy or in the case of a woman with breast cancer. Science is getting closer and closer to being able to target that for prostate cancer. A lot of research going on, uh, you should know about this, where people instead of doing a PSA test, which is a common thing as a guy gets older, they will do a simple urine test or blood test and even when somebody doesn't have prostate cancer, they'll be able to tell who has the markers for very dangerous, like there are women who do for breast cancer. No, right. they have particular markers that are potentially very dangerous. In my case, what I started 14 years ago was going through a series of biopsies. They are no fun. And entered into a program called active surveillance. When I was diagnosed... I was told um, in a consult after I, was, uh, after I was diagnosed with prostate cancer that if I didn't have treatment right away, that the surgeon could not ensure that he could save my life. And that's where the thinking was at that point. But at the medical research centers like Sloan Kettering in New York, um, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, UCLA in Los Angeles, and uh, MD Anderson in Houston and the Mayo Clinic, they were already at a more European opinion about prostate cancer that for many men, it's just to be managed and watched closely known as active surveillance. So I went into the active surveillance program instead of having surgery or radiation or anything like that 14 years ago and have continued on that path all these years and had biopsies uh, first every six months, then once a year, then 18 months, then two years. And then starting, I guess, about six years ago, six, I guess, I started having these specialized MRIs that were experimental at first. The insurance companies still try to treat them as experimental. And with these um, MRIs, they're able to see, with the most sophisticated ones, exactly what cancer there is and if there's any dangerous cancers at all. And again, this year, second year in a row, I'm happy to report that I have zero dangerous cancer showing. Zero. So mm -hmm. I don't even have to have biopsies. I didn't have My a biopsy candles last worked. year. My candles worked. Your candles <laughs> did work? Okay. So last year, this year, and I'll continue on this path. Other people, like I have a friend right now getting treatment at Mayo in Rochester, Minnesota, and he wasn't as lucky as I was. And so he, um, he had uh, prostate cancer that was, even though it was caught early, was likely to be more aggressive, and he's had to have treatment. And so it really is an individual thing, and that's what I want you to know as a family member who loves a guy or you're the guy himself, I want you to know that there is not one path with prostate cancer. It is your responsibility not to get lost in the Internet and all the gobbledygook and all the crazy stuff that goes on there, but to do real medical research. There's a lot of stuff available from the Prostate Cancer Foundation, from Which the various... Which on the board. I am on the board for a long time, and um, the university-based research centers that specialize in prostate cancer write very thorough stuff 
so you understand not just what you're told. Do not just nod your head at whatever some medical professional says, because even though they're bright, they may have practiced for decades, that like any other professional, they get kind of set in their ways in the way they do things. And a lot of men who should either expedite treatment, don't do that, and a lot of men who shouldn't have treatment at all, at least yet, have treatments that are unnecessary. This is one that you need to be a good consumer. You need to be informed. And you need to know that depending on the urologist you're seeing, the oncologist you're seeing, you may get eye rolls from them, but the reality is it's your life, it's your body, and it's your health and you need to be your own advocate. When I was diagnosed 14 years ago, the most developed medical information about prostate cancer in English was actually from Lancet, which is a medical journal in Europe, in England. And that's where I learned and saw within, in Britain they called watchful waiting, and that's where I learned about that and learned to ask questions and wanted to know um, how much cancer I had, which is determined by something known as a Gleason score. And it's not like you think of with normal cancer, uh, stage one to four, it's a different thing with prostate cancer. And so the more you know, if you're worried, if you're diagnosed, the better it is for you to be part of being a partner with the medical industry to make sure that you are getting the care you should get and the treatment, if necessary, that you're getting the right treatment. And by the way, I'm talking narrowly about prostate cancer because that's the one I really know. But what I've said is true for most cancers, that you need to be your own patient advocate. You don't just passively go into the night and say, well, he or she is like the greatest at this. That's what I've heard. And maybe they are the greatest at whatever they do with whatever cancer or illness you have. But you don't just say, yes, doctor, whatever you say. They are not on Mount Olympus. They are just human beings like you and me, except they spent forever in medical school, internship, residency, fellowship, Specialized training. Yeah, so they know a lot. But do they know you and do they know with all the patients they see, are they digging deep enough? And it's by you asking the right questions and going for second opinions and maybe even traveling somewhere else in the country. It's always been true with medicine that people that are more affluent are more willing to ask questions. People that are less affluent are afraid, they're intimidated by the medical establishment and by doctors. Do not, regardless of your station in life or how many zeros are in your checking account following the first digit, know that your life is precious just like somebody with more zeros in their account. And it's up to you to make sure you get the care that you deserve to improve your health and save your life. And uh, if there are any doctors that are unhappy with me, this is the segment, right? Well, for us to talk about that. I agree with you, and you and I unfortunately know a couple people in the last few years that have passed away that had aggressive cancers that they just went to the one doctor. Um, and didn't we tried to get them to seek other care and they thought their doctor was going to be fine and it's really really important to get at least a second opinion yeah i mean both of us the reason you hear so much passion from me and the reason i have krista standing here is that both of us had very good friends who died because they did not get good care uh, we think for, at least we don't know for sure but it but if they had gotten more care we would have known for sure you know yeah so the they died of neglect first and maybe cancer second. And that's why you, and if you're too ill yourself, your loved ones have got to be there as your advocate. 
Yeah. And I'm very, very grateful that you're doing so well. And I think you've been such a good example to other people of like doing what you said, advocating for yourself, doing the research, you know, seeing other people. So I'm really, um, I'm happy for you that you've been able to be so successful with the watchful waiting. Well, and the other thing, I want to emphasize one thing before we go into questions. And that is that I kind of flew by it, but Google is a great tool and a dangerous one. I mean, anything you have, uh, you could have the sniffles, and in two steps on the Internet, you're going to die, right? Right. We Whatever. call it Dr. Google. It's not yeah. Dr. Google. And then, and then with other things, uh, you'll have something, and you'll go read all this rabbit hole stuff about, oh, well, just drink this elixir, and everything's going to be fine, or whatever. There are a lot of brilliant scientists and doctors, medical professionals, who are doing incredible research on not what current practice is, but more state-of-the-art kind of things with various illnesses. That's why you want to be in the medical journals. And what I had to do is I had to have two windows open. I had one where I was going and reading the various definitions of things because I don't understand medical terminology at all and reading the content because it was so personal to me that normally anything in science or medicine I just zone out. In this case I was all focused and that's where I was able to make the decisions I needed to make. So Krista? Let's go to one question today. This only is, one? I talk too much? It's okay. This is from Jack Sorry. in Maine. What is Clark's opinion about the safety of bank, credit card, and retirement accounts when signing up for a personal financial management company like Mint? Is the convenience of all your financial information in one place worth the risk of all your financial information in one place? Yeah, and that is a great question, Jack. So what's going on in the industry is the most sophisticated players, and I'm pretty sure Mint is totally in on this. Mm -hmm is that you don't have your username and password stored on the screen scraper site. That, that's what they call it in the banking industry is the screen scrapers that have all your information. You can see it and you see you're doing better, worse, how your debts are doing, your investments, your savings all automatically is technology that's been developed is where you sign into your account with um, whoever it is, whatever the cooperating institution is, and then it gives a permission to that site to access the information in an automated way. And so even if a hacker gets into one of these sites, with most of them, they no longer have the ability to have your usernames and passwords. The industry really saw the risk you're talking about, Jack, so what you look for with any of these financial management sites or budgeting sites or whatever is you want to know how they access the information on your account. And if they have to have stored your username and password, that's where the real risk is. And I want to thank you for being with us today. And again, I'm sorry we didn't get to more of your questions. I just feel so strongly about the medical issue and the issue of life and death under treatment and over treatment that I really wanted to emphasize that so that you will not accept whatever somebody tells you in medicine without doing your own homework. And speaking of doing your homework for your wallet, we are there for you around the clock at Clark.com new articles posted every day with information that empowers you with knowledge so you can make better decisions about your wallet today, tomorrow, and for years to come. Join our new community. Talk about it, Krista. Our community on Clark.com. It's like the old-fashioned message boards, but we've modernized what we're doing, and it's great, and people are helping each other in there, which we love. And I do love that because I want you to be a member of Team Clark.